each and every one of you hopes you're going to be greatly successful. But just in case, you should have a plan B, not to grow rich, but to create wealth. And that's what I want to talk to you about today in just these few brief moments. Some of you will dismiss this because your father or mother tried to tell you this a long time ago. But some of you will be wise enough to know that it's good to have a plan B kind of rolling along in the background so that if you're successful beyond belief and you wind up on your yacht trading in, you know, in the winter months, that's great. But at some point in your life, you will have the independence of knowing you can quit working and have your money work for you. That's where I want to bring you starting today. So let me give you five things that I think you have to know. The first, be optimistic. Don't bet against America. America will survive and prosper, and so will you if you plan, save, and invest. It is very tempting to get caught up in the troubles of your time. I mean, your grandparents, the Depression, World War II, the Korean War, Kennedy being killed. Um, for me, it was when OPEC got us in the early 70s, and there were lines around the block just to get gas at gas stations. It looked like the end of America. Gosh, it's looked like the end of America a lot of times, most recently in 2008, 2009 in the financial crisis. It never has been. And if I'm wrong about that, then nothing you do in the world of financial services is going to matter. So don't bet against America. Whatever you do, be optimistic about the long run. A second and a corollary to that, by the way, Warren Buffett and I shared that same opinion on stage, and we both looked at each other and went, right. That's the basis of Warren Buffett's philosophy, too. The second thing I want to say is, you have to be very careful right now about setting your goals, besides your goals for success in this world. I want you to think in very carefully and define prosperity. I, for a long time, for up until maybe 10 years ago, it was about having stuff, the biggest house, the fastest cars, the three-car garage. You know, I remember when two cars was a big deal, three cars in your garage and so forth. I think probably for most of you that your baseline definition of prosperity should be that you're never up in the middle of the night worried that you or you and your family won't be able to survive for the next few months, that you're really out of money. That's an important thing to know. The second most important thing, I think, is to be honest with yourself. <laughs> you can fool everybody else in the world, but eventually, if you try to fool yourself, it will come back to haunt you. Um, I think the world, you, are, you already have your own money personality. And it's going to impact every decision you make. And I don't know whether it comes from genetics or whether it comes from environment or experiences you've had. Basically, I think it boils down to two types of people in the world. They are the savers and the spenders. And for better or for worse, by the way, they tend to marry each other. And you know who you are. Now, you can't change your basic money personality, but you can set up systems so that you negate the angst that your money personality can create for you. Because it's very important that if you're going to be successful in the world of money, that you understand yourself first. Talk just one second about the power of money. I, give, I, I spend my whole life now traveling around the country. I've written a bunch of books. Big corporations hire me, talk to our employees about the 401k plan. Look, you're all smart. Most of those people aren't even smart. So you can make smart decisions. And knowledge isn't a secret anymore. Knowledge is available everywhere. When I started doing this, you know, I was selling books. It was a very big deal, but I made about 12 cents on every book or whatever. But the point was that knowledge was given to only a select few people, and you had to work hard to find it. You're the knowledge experts. So what else do you need to have in order to harness the power of money? You need self-discipline. Without self-discipline, it, well, it's the essence of all decision making. It, it's simple. I mean, you go to, you're on a diet, you go to the refrigerator, and there's a piece of chocolate cake, and you know you shouldn't, but you do. That's self-discipline. But when it comes to money, it's particularly important because two emotions confront you whenever you make a financial decision that don't relate to, should we, uh, should we go to this movie or that movie? Should I have dessert or not have dessert? Should I take an extra drink or not? Those two emotions are, of course, fear and greed. And I want you to know that uh, fear can be equally as perilous as greed. Greed says, I could press this position 
and I could buy that new car. I mean, I could press this position, and I, I mean, two more limit up days, and I'm going to have da 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 da. So it makes you take risks that you haven't really assessed. That's the emotion. But fear paralyzes you and keeps you from making smart decisions. And I don't care who you are, how smart you are, those two emotions will come to the fore. Know yourself. I want to give you a lesson that I give to the, the basics. So understand that I talk to a lot of people in corporate America who are not financially based. But I think you'll find it interesting. It's about the power of money to work very powerfully for you or against you. And I start with this. First of all, by the way, how many people have student loan debt? OK. I have a new column up today about student loan repayment scams. Think about that when I give you this basic one. So let me talk about credit card debt. Right now, there's more student loan debt, by the way, than credit card debt. 1.3 trillion in student loans, about 1.1 trillion in credit card debt. Let me give you this quick example, because you're all too smart for this. Suppose you charge $2,000, and uh, you get the bill at the end of the month. Maybe you uh, went on a trip, or bought new clothes, or furniture, or it was a bunch of things. And you go, oh my god, I, I don't have $2,000. So you go, oh, well, this makes it affordable, a minimum monthly payment. Minimum monthly payment, very small amount. I can do that. And suppose your finance charge is 19.8%. You will be surprised to know that many people write me paying 27, 28% finance charges because they're so buried in debt they can't get a low rate card. And maybe you pay $40 a year in annual fees for the card, or perhaps you, um, you uh, have a late charge or something like that. My question to you is doing this, minimum monthly payments, how long will it take you to pay this card off? OK, math geniuses. How long will it take you to pay that card off? OK. It will take you 31 years and two months, the way they charge the minimums. And along the way, you'll pay $8,202 in interest charges on top of the $2,000 you charged. That, my folks, is money, friends, is uh, money working very powerfully against you. And people don't realize it. 31 years from now, you know, the vacation you went on, you won't even remember who you were with. And, and if you bought clothes, I guarantee you they're, they're long gone. They went to the Salvation Army years ago. And you're still paying interest. Now, this is the lesson I give. Suppose you took the same $2,000 and invested it. And I won't make a whole long story, as I do for everyone else. I tell them, how about a stock market mutual fund? Let's just take the S&P 500 stock market tracking index fund. What should we say the average annual return is? Well, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that says the average annual return over the last 30 years has been, in fact, the last 50 years, has been a little over 10%. So that's what we'll put in there, 10% a year. And we'll put it in an IRA so we don't have to worry about taxes. The same $2,000 that you put down the drain and in interest and close would have grown to be $38,389. Now that, you know, the balance is really not impressive to you, not once. But suppose you understand the concept of time is money a very important thing because you have time on your side. When you're old, you'd give anything to have time. When you're young, you'd give anything to have money. But time leverages money. So if you did this once, you get $38,000. But if you did it every year for the next 31 years, where your first contribution to your IRA has 30 years to grow, and then the last few years, you'd have 364000 That's 30 years from now. If you start now and do it for 50 years. And I know that seems like an ungodly amount of time, but 50 years ago, I was you. You would have $2.5 million. Just average investing in the stock market. And everybody says, well, I don't have $2,000 a year extra. What does she think? I've got student loans. She already knows that. Look, that works out to be $38.46 a week. So enough with the lattes, and don't buy the next round. That's the secret. And I want to ask you one more question. All of you, do you all get a paycheck now, your interns? Have you all ever gotten a paycheck? Do you have a little box in, the, in there marked FICA, a deduction on your paycheck? Have you ever seen that? You know what that is. That's Social Security. Do you know what FICA stands for? You're gonna, they're going to take it out all your life. FICA, Social Security. But do you know what the initials stand for? Federal Insurance Contributions Act. You're making a contribution to my retirement, by the way, because I don't know what will be there. 
But you can't go, contributions, I always think it's voluntary. You can't walk into HR and say, excuse me, I'm a little tight for money this month, my student loans, I don't think I can afford to contribute to FICA. Now watch this. That's FICA. In 2017, if you make the maximum amount, well, over $100,000, and all of you will be doing that in a minute, they can take $7,888 out of your paycheck for FICA, that's going to me, that's the amount, 6.2%, the employer pays an equal amount, by the way. But if instead you had invested that same amount that you're letting them take out of your paycheck at the stock market, at our 10% S&P 500 index, with that average annual return of 10%, you would have over $10 million. You're giving your way, your future, to our generation. I understand there's a potential for great generation warfare here. But at least the folks that ever hear me in their 20s think about this will realize that it's pretty easy just to put the money away before you see it and spend it. You're letting them do it for you. You'll never see it. Why don't you do the same for yourself in an IRA or Roth IRA? Oh my god, I'm almost out of time. I want to throw this in. Anybody credit card debt? OK. If you know anybody, your brother surely has it. You're the smart one sitting here, or your sister. Double the current minimum monthly payment. Never charge another. Pay that same amount every month. Not the new, double the new minimum. The current minimum. Pay the same amount every month. Don't charge another penny. And your card will be paid off in less than three years. And I just want to show you two more slides while I'm winding down to the end. I, I always talk about risk and reward. The bulls, the bears, and the chickens, my category. Set some money aside in savings. Even if you're trading, set some money aside. Chicken money lets you sleep at night. You don't get rich, but you don't get poor. And you will trade better if you have chicken money. And finally, I want to show you this. You're here to try and beat the market. But you don't have to beat the market. Over the long run, you can do well just being the market. Last year, look at that. 66% of active funds failed to beat their benchmarks. Over the last 15 years, 92% failed to beat their benchmarks. You don't, and, and a lot of those funds folded. You don't have to beat the market. You just have to be the market. So take these last two slides. This is the Ibbotson chart that goes back to 1926. The top, it's a value, it's not the stock market, it's the value of $1 invested. The bottom line is inflation, about 3%. The top line is a portfolio, diverse, call it the S&P 500, reinvested, dividends reinvested, average annual return of 10%. Not every year. Take that top line. It beats certainly treasury bills and bonds, but take that top blue line, that historic line. If you take one-year periods, that's the blue bar. The middle line is break even. If you hold stocks that diversified portfolio for one year, you, and any year, they looked at every year, going back to 1926, you got a 50-50 chance of making money. The green bar, five-year holding periods, got about a two to one chance of making money. But all right, you're way ahead of me. Go all the way down to the pink bar. Those are 20-year periods. They looked at every 20-year period going back to 1926, 29 to 49, 52 to 72, 79 to 90, and whatever it was, there has never been a year where you lost money in a diversified portfolio of large company stocks, and you'll notice it's slightly above the line by about 3%, beating inflation, even adjusted for inflation. So while you're out there making your entire fortune, how about a regular program of automatic investing? Start by spending less than you earn, paying down your debt, setting aside some of that chicken money in the bank, safe. Don't touch it. Don't think about it. It's a cushion that lets you be much more uh, sensible about the risks you do take and stick with your plan. Make an automatic investment plan, just like they take FICA out. If you get a 401k or open an IRA at Fidelity or Vanguard, I know it's very uncool. But just keep putting that $2,000 at a minimum a year away, because you're optimistic about America. Make that plan and stick to it when the market's crashing. Oh, I was on every TV show in March of 2009. Oh, it's the end of the world. The Dow is 6,700. It's going to go to zero. No, don't sell. I said, don't sell. Your $300 a month or $1,000 a month is buying more shares at lower prices. And here we are at Dow 21,000. Always, as you make more, adjust upward and invest more. Don't take the money out for any reason. Let it work for you. This is my website, terrysavage.com. You can post questions and, uh, on my blog there and read all my columns. I don't sell anything. I've never sold any financial service or product since I stopped being a stockbroker. But what I do sell, and I hope you buy, 
is that no matter what your other goals, and family and health and every other goal that you have are really important, the wealth goal, not getting rich, but growing wealthy, it should be a subtext of every single thing you do. I know you will all be successful because you made your way here. Let your money work for you as hard as you work for it. That's a savage truth, abruptly. <laughs>